I'm Shintaro Yamaguchi, an international tax partner with PwC Tax Japan, where I lead the inbound and U.S. outbound tax practices. Today, I'm delighted to have with me Doug McConey, PwC's global leader, international tax services. Doug has his own podcast, The Cross-Border Tax Talks, where he's hosted over 100 episodes addressing the latest trends on international taxation, together with PwC's experts from around the world. Doug, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. This is the second session of our four-part series, and today I'd like to discuss recent U.S. tax developments, in particular the Inflation Reduction Act. The past few years, when I look back, there's been so much change in, in U.S. tax law. And uh, Japanese multinationals with significant operations in the U.S. have been closely monitoring those developments. Uh, we start with 2017, the Trump administration tax reform, otherwise known as the Tax Cuts and uh, Jobs Act. Then we had the Biden administration's uh, tax proposals, which were in the Build Back Better plan, uh, which ultimately did not pass Congress. And then most recently, last summer, we had the Inflation Reduction Act. And I get two questions from Japanese clients. One is around the 15% book minimum tax, newly introduced. And the second is around the clean tech climate ESG related taxes and incentives. So if you can walk us through each of those features, that would, that would be great. I mean, first, the 15% book minimum tax. Yeah, I think, you know, just to put to give a little bit additional context, Shen, I think many of us were surprised that we did not see much more draconian, much bigger international tax changes that were originally proposed in the Build Back Better Act. but Which were expected, such as Pillar 2 compliant right, legislation. Right, changes to the guilty regime and a number of other changes. Potential and, changes to the tax to rates the beat, initially. Um, our, our base erosion anti-abuse tax. And so we really didn't see any of that. Um, but you're right, all we really ended up with was the Inflation Reduction Act with its, what was referred to as the book minimum tax or the corporate alternative minimum tax it was really there were a couple of others, but I think that's really been the big provision applicable for, for multinationals or the multi multinationals are the most focused on. And the way that rule works is, first of all, it only applies for companies that have one billion of profit globally. So if you're a U.S. parented company, you have to have one billion of profit. So not top line revenue, but one billion of profit. If you're a Japanese parented or a non-US parented group, you still have to have a billion of overall profit, but you have to have a hundred million of profit in the US for these rules to apply. So it, first of all, it's a, it's a pretty high threshold. You have to be a, a very large organization for this to potentially apply. And generally what this does is that it requires companies to pay a 15% tax on a concept called adjusted financial statement income. And so similar to Pillar 2, which we talked about in the first, in the first uh, part of the series, that this is a, a kind of a novel concept for U.S. taxpayers to have to do a calculation based on adjusted financial statement income. So you generally start with U.S. GAAP, and then there are a whole number and series of adjustments that, that need to, to take place. And what happens is, is that after you do the calculation, you multiply the 15% times your adjusted um, financial statement income. And if that tax exceeds the normal corporate income tax that a taxpayer would pay, then the alternative minimum tax, the corporate alternative minimum tax has to be paid. Now, what's interesting is that this is really kind of a timing issue in that in future years, if a company then pays the, it gets back into the, the regular corporate income tax, in other words, if the regular corporate income tax is more than the corporate alternative minimum tax, then taxpayers can then use any a corporate alternative minimum tax that they paid in the past as a credit against that future corporate corporate income tax. And so many taxpayers, I think, view this as more of a timing issue. But unfortunately, for those companies that meet the revenue thresholds, there is a significant compliance burden exactly. to be able to do the calculations and get the, the adjusted financial statement income set up within their systems, which is, is a challenge similar to the Pillar 2 starting point. And to your point, this applies to inbound companies as well. So Japanese multinationals would also have to look at the one billion, a hundred million dollar thresholds to determine if they if this if these rules would apply. Right. And the way generally the rules work is kind of once you meet the 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 criteria, once you meet the requirements, you are you're once you're in it, you're in it. Um, and so it will be important, particularly for companies that may be around the numbers that aren't that close, to monitor that very, very carefully. 
The other important piece to remember is that these rules, unlike Pillar 2, are effective for tax years starting on or after January 1st, 2023. And so there is this timing element where companies, for whether you're a U.S. parented group or, or a non-U.S. parented group, if you are within the corporate alternative minimum tax and then potentially use that corporate alternative minimum tax as a credit in future years, it's important for taxpayers to understand the implications that that could have on your Pillar 2 calculations as the credit for the corporate alternative minimum tax is likely not considered a good covered tax or a good credit for Pillar 2 purposes. And I think that has taken many companies by surprise, sort of that interaction between the corporate alternative minimum tax and Pillar 2. And, and on the point of Pillar 2, just to confirm, 15% uh, book minimum tax doesn't have anything to do with Pillar 2 itself. Is that is my understanding yeah, correct? It's, it's a great question, Shin, because it's 15%. It's a minimum tax. And so it's, I think, understandably for taxpayers and frankly, advisors, when these four rules first came out to say, well, th is this the US's version of a Pillar 2 tax or a qualified domestic minimum top, top up tax? And the answer is, this is nothing to do with Pillar 2. Uh, the, the, only, the only interaction is that it says 15% in book minimum tax. The base of the tax, the adjusted financial statement income is significantly different different than the Pillar 2 base. It allows for, um, it, you don't do it jurisdiction by jurisdiction. You effectively consolidate all of the, the subsidiaries that are below the U.S. And so it is not a, a Pillar 2 tax, despite the, the fact that it is a 15% tax on book income. Mm. I see. So it's not, it's, it, although it is 15% minimum tax, it does not have anything to do with Pillar 2. Uh, and, but, it, but for the exception that you have to understand the relationship with Pillar 2 as a whole. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And again, for, for taxpayers that could end up in the corporate alternative minimum tax, and then per particularly for those that may be coming out of the corporate alternative minimum tax that end up in a regular corporate tax position, particularly for Japanese multinationals, um, they need to be very mindful about whether this could cause the U.S., if they use the corp corporate alternative minimum tax to significantly reduce their U.S. taxable income, that could cause them to fall below the 15% globe rate and could require an income inclusion for that Japanese parent. So to your point, the interaction of these provisions is very important. Something we need to keep in mind for sure. Uh, in terms of... Uh ESG, Japanese companies are very focused on ESG and, and so curious as to how these $307 billion worth of credits and, and tax incentives might uh, be applying to multinationals. Yeah, this was really a big win for the Biden administration. And I think many people that were have been following the U.S. closely on what, what we will be able to do um, from a green energy perspective were frankly really surprised with this result and view this as a very favor favorable development from a green energy perspective. That will jumpstart the whole uh, ESG yeah, jump environmental. jumpstart the ESG environmental focus from a U.S. perspective. And I think, you know, Japanese multinationals that are looking to invest in the U.S. or frankly, Japanese multinationals that have already significantly invested in the U.S. and are looking to update plants or update offices from a green energy perspective, anything you're doing relating to building out or improvements, there are opportunities to potentially qualify for, for these tax credits. And there are just numerous provisions, everything from clean tech to... Yeah, absolutely. It's, yeah, a, it's a broad yeah. swath of various green energy incentives. And so again, it's really important for companies to be able to, 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 to look and, and see what is available because a lot of these investments, frankly, companies were making irrespective of, of these tax law changes and a, a lot of eligibility out there. Uh, last question. Is this the end or is there anything we need to keep well watch out for post uh, Inflation Reduction Act? I, I think it's going to be quiet from a legislative perspective, but I think what's very important for Japanese multinationals and frankly, anybody who operates in the U.S. is to, to monitor our regulations. Um, there were some changes that have occurred within the last few months related to our foreign tax credit. And we can see that Treasury will continue to play a very active role. And so that we still will need to monitor those changes more from a regulatory perspective than a statutory perspective. Okay, that's very helpful. Doug, thank you so much. I mean, there's so much going on in U.S. tax and we'll have to continue monitoring, it seems. Really appreciate you joining us today. Thanks for having me. Thank you.